I'm just little old me with my goofy sense of humor and target fashion. But that does not mean that God cannot use me. He has a plan and a part for me to play in disciple making, just as he has a plan for you. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Let's pray before we get started. God, I just thank you for this opportunity to share my heart, to share the words that you've given me. I pray that as uh, we share these things today, that you would speak to people's hearts. Um, I might not have the words, I might not have the brilliant things to say, but God, you know how to touch people's hearts. And I just ask as people are sitting at home or wherever they're at, that you would speak to them and that you would stir in them a calling and a longing to be disciple makers. So let's talk about what discipleship is. What discipleship is, is really opening your life. So last week, Drew shared a book with us. And not to be outdone, I'm also going to share a book with you all. And let's just say mine is better, because mine is written by my dad. My dad is all about disciple making. In fact, I count myself as one of his disciples. In the book, he defines discipleship as an intentional friendship with another person, with Jesus at its core. I've lived this. I've seen it firsthand. You might say, well, of course you were discipled by your dad. I mean, he's your dad. But not all parental relationships are intentional about raising their kids to follow Jesus and make disciples. My dad definitely did, and I'm living proof of it today. But I would like to build on my dad's definition to add, discipleship is opening your life so others can see how you live life with Jesus and encourage others to do the same. It's not about imparting knowledge. It's about imparting life. In 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, it says, And you should imitate me as I imitate Christ. Paul said this after discussing a list of questions about how to live and act in the world that early Christians were surrounded by. The simple answer to these questions is, Do what I do as I look to Jesus. It's not about having all the right theological answers to deep questions. It's going before someone and asking them to come along with you. Will you get it wrong sometimes? Yes, we all will. The point is not to have all the knowledge. The point is to point people to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, and he'll take care of the rest. So how do you know if you're qualified? The problem is that so many people don't feel qualified. They believe that they have to have read the whole Bible or have special training. This is always all a lie. If you know Jesus, you are qualified to point others to others to him as well. That's your job, to point people to Jesus. And you were cre uniquely created for just that. In the same way that I'm not funny like Drew or stylish like Trish, you don't have to be like anyone else in the way that you make disciples. In fact, who you are is who you are for a purpose. God made you unique and qualified and will give you the words to say. The Bible says that you were created as a work of beauty. In Ephesians 2.10, it says, For we were created as God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do all good things that he planned for us long ago. The word masterpiece here is the Greek word poema. You're a poem, a work of art, so beautiful and unique that there is not another person just like you in all of human history. This should be awe-inspiring. You are awe-inspiring. And you have a plan to do good things that God planned for you long ago. Things that I can't do. People to reach that Drew can't reach and words to speak that only you can speak. In the book of Jeremiah, in the first chapter, God says this to Jeremiah. I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and I anointed you. Jeremiah responds, oh, sovereign God, I can't speak for you. I'm too young. But the Lord replied, don't say I'm too young, for you must go wherever I send you and say whatever I tell you. And don't be afraid of the people, for I will be with you and will protect you. I, the Lord, have spoken. Then the Lord reached out and touched my mouth and said, Look, I have put my words in your mouth. This conversation took place at the beginning of Jeremiah's call to ministry. He didn't feel adequately prepared. He didn't believe he had anything to say. But the truth is, God gave him the words to speak as he needed. Jeremiah was qualified to speak because he was in connection with God. Just like Jeremiah, God has known you since before you were born. He knew exactly what you would become and exactly who you would be. He knows exactly the people you are to disciple. He's placing people in your life that only you can reach. And he will give you the words to speak as necessary. You have been given a unique gifting to help accomplish this task. 
Like I said, I'm not funny like Drew. In fact, no one tells dad jokes quite like him. And I'm not like my dad who writes books and travels around the world speaking to pastors and churches about disciple making. But I still have things that I'm good at that neither Drew nor my dad can do. For one thing, I'm really good at making people at feel at home. I'm not a gourmet chef, but I do make really great tasting food and I love feeding people. I love having people in my home. Even though I'm a crazy introvert, I love having people in my home every Sunday morning to watch Aloha Church. It makes me super stoked when people linger and hang out and stay with each other. It's my secret goal to have people just stay all day and chill out. And like I said, I'm a crazy introvert. So on Mondays, I curl up and hide from the world with a content feeling in my heart knowing that my home provided a place for people to connect and grow together in Christ. It's truly the highlight of my week. I don't have to be funny like Drew. I don't have to travel the world like my dad. I don't have to win the great British baking show. I don't even have to be an extrovert to love people and bring them in my home. I just have to be open to use the gifts God gave me and he will do the rest as I remain in him. So what are your gifts? How can you use what comes naturally to you to open up space in your life for others? Once you've done that, the next step is finding disciples. So now you know what discipleship is and that you're uniquely created to participate in God's mission, but how do you get started? Where do you find disciples? The easy answer is pray. Ask God to show you the people he has placed in your life. A few years ago, I completed a master's program and was trying to figure out what to do next with my life. I spent some time in prayer asking God, what do you want me to do next? His answer was to love the people he put in front of me. For someone like me who likes tasks and achievements and accomplishment, this was not quite the answer I was looking for. But nonetheless, it was what God was asking me to do. So I asked him who he had in mind. One specific person was a girl named Daryl. God told me to be the spiritual mom she never had. Now at this point, I was just getting to know her and I wasn't just gonna go up to her and say, God wants me to be your spiritual mom. So instead we just started hanging out. I knew she wanted to start a coffee shop. So I suggested we start visiting coffee shops all around San Diego. That laid the basis for conversation and activity. Again, as an introvert, it helps to have something in common to talk about or it can easily get really, really awkward. <laughs> After a couple of weeks of spending time and sharing lives, she said, you know, you're kind of like a spiritual mom to me. Funny, I said, because here's what God told me. And I told her what God had been speaking to me, and she's called me mom ever since. Trav and I have tried to live our lives openly in front of Daryl. In fact, she lived with us for about six months before she got married. Talk about living your life with Jesus in front of people. She saw Trav and I on good days, on not so good days, on times of compassion, and times when we were, well, let's just call it intention. <laughs> We did our best to allow her to see our lives and how at the end of the day, we still love Jesus and our desire to pursue him with all of our hearts, even when we make mistakes. Along the way, we have continued to collect other kids. Here's a picture of several of them. Many of those in the picture have moved on to other churches or places in life. As people move in and out of our immediate contact, we continue to pray for God to bring others along. Some of you may know Abraham Lopez. He started to come, coming to Aloha about a year ago. He would show up every Thursday night last summer at our hangout at Law Street. Over time, we built a relationship with him. As he has questions about life and God, we're there to point him back to Jesus. We also get to do things like take him to REI for the first time and introduce him to Star Wars. We live life with and alongside him. He has become our disciple. Recently, two of our disciples, Rachel and Connor, moved away to attend a ministry training program. While I do miss them, I'm stoked that I got to be a part of launching them into the next step that God has for them. After they left, I realized that once again, we had room in our lives to add more disciples. I'm praying and trusting God will bring the right people along. Finding people simply starts with praying, reaching out, and inviting people to do life with you. Some will stick around and others won't. That's okay, just be open when they do stay. People have to make the decision to follow on their own. All you can do is ask and be willing. So how do you know if you've been successful at discipling? Well, success looks like continuum. What does it look like to be a successful disciple maker? Well, are those you've been discipling, discipling others? If so, then I would consider that success. 
Ralph Moore, in his book, defines this as multiplying the fun by passing the process into the hands of your disciples. Paul shows us a great example of this principle. In 2 Timothy 2, verses 1 to 2, he says, Timothy, my dear son, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Jesus Christ. You have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will pass them on to others. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Now he is admonishing his disciple to do the same. Timothy had been given the mantle of pastoring the gathering of Christians in Ephesus that Paul had started. Paul was handing off the work to the next disciple maker. It's a continuum. So follow me as I follow Christ so that others will follow you and so on. While the discipling relationship may last a lifetime, it should change and evolve. Daryl spent a lot of time in our home and one-on-one -on -one in coffee shops. Now we don't see each other as often, but I know she's making disciples and that fills me with joy. Ian and Amanda moved back to Riverside, but before they left, they shared that they felt their time with us was preparing them to take what they had heard and seen back to their friends and family in their hometown. Rachel and Connor are starting... Oh, it's... <laughs> Fills my heart with so much joy. Connor and Rachel are starting a ministry training course that will prepare them for the next step in their life with ministry. We got to be a part of preparing them and sending them off. Abraham is asking questions about discipleship and he's stepping into what we hope will become a disciple-making relationship with another dude. So true success for me would be defined as knowing that those they are disciples, discipling will also make other disciples. I may never meet those generational disciples in person, but I hope that one day when I stand before Jesus, that he says, well done, and shows me a long generational line that continues on from those I poured into. Just as my dad, who's watching this today, can take pride in the fact that he followed Jesus's and Paul's examples by discipling me, he now gets to find joy in watching me as I disciple others. And lastly, disciple making should be fun. Let me say this before we finish. This process should be about multiplying fun. Yes, it is a command from Jesus, but it's not an obligation to do begrudgingly. It's about having fun with friends as you all walk towards Jesus. If it is a chore for you, spend some time with Jesus. You may be trying to disciple the wrong people or possibly in the wrong way. Discipleship should be a natural extension of your life with Christ. So our takeaways today are number one, Discipleship is opening your life so others can see how you live with Jesus and encouraging to them to do the same. Number two, you are uniquely created to answer God's call in your life to make disciples. Number three, get started by asking God to point out people he has for you to disciple. Four, success comes in continuum. When those you disciple, disciple others. And five, disciple making is fun. Thank you so much for letting me share with you today. I hope you're encouraged to go out and make disciples. You don't really need any special qualifications or degrees. And I know that from experience. If I can do it, you can do this too. So take the first step today and start by asking God who you're to disciple. Let's pray. God, I wanna thank you so much for everybody who's watching today. And I ask that you would stir in all of our hearts what it means to make disciples, how to live life openly so that others can see how we live with you. God, it's about just opening ourselves up and asking people to come along. And as a final encouragement, I want to read the words of the Apostle Paul in Ephesians. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your words, roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Jesus Christ through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Thanks, guys. Aloha.